So thank you all so much for joining us here this evening. My name is Edward. I am president of Chicago Ornithological Society. Um, and I'm super thrilled to bring uh, Bob Dolgan back to Birds and Bites, a regular contributor to share his most recent film with us this evening. Um, Birds and Bites is our virtual program platform of Chicago Ornithological Society. These programs are free and open to all. So definitely be sure to pop over to chicagobird.org for future versions of this program and to become a member to support awesome free programs like this. Uh, but as mentioned before, we'll get into the program here in just a minute. Just please make sure that you are muted for the duration of the program here so as not to disturb or, you know, wreck the experience for other folks here. It's like muting your cell phone in a theater. Mute yourself in the Zoom room here while we're showing the Zoom movie. Um, and with that said, if you have questions at all, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat at any point in time. We will get back to those after the film where we will have some time with Bob, the filmmaker, uh, to talk to us about his film and answer any questions that come up during and after the film. But with that said, you didn't come here to listen to me talk. Uh, I will go ahead and turn it over to Bob to uh, introduce himself, the film, and kick things off here. Take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, Edward, and uh, thanks to COS for having me back and another opportunity to share one of these stories. Um, <clears throat> so I was thinking about what I should say uh, to introduce the film tonight, and, uh, you know, we're with a birding crowd, so maybe the word fluddles is just like, you know, not even that interesting <laughs> to all of you, and you, you talk, you use, you use the term regularly. It does seem like it's a pretty well-used Illinois birding term, but... Um, I got some feedback recently from someone who had mentioned, you know, they they didn't think the film was actually about wetlands, but rather it was about floodles. And um, it's sort of confusing to me because a floodle is a wetland and wetlands often are floodles. Um, it, but, you know, I, I need to take a step back sometimes and remind myself that a lot of people don't think about wetlands and even I before embarking probably on the last five years or so of more serious birding and then eventually uh, getting into this film, couldn't have really told you exactly what do Illinois wetlands look like when you hear the stats, like Illinois has lost 90% of its wetlands. Um, you know, I'm guessing most people just drive through the state and they they see the corn fields and soybean fields and it, it's like, yeah, where are, where are the wetlands? This is the prairie state. Um, there, there isn't any water. There hasn't been any water, but actually, there is. There was a lot of water, uh, and and that is uh, that is sort of um, at the crux of this film and the importance of the water to uh, birds and uh, and and habitat. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the term floodles uh, is a term that was coined by a pair of DuPage County birders, Jim and Kate Fraser, back in the nineties. Um, it was. Uh, a sort of uh, sniglet of the words uh, fluddle and puddle, and it quickly uh, it quickly spread uh, throughout uh, throughout the Midwest. At first, being used to describe these intermittent watery areas where they weren't quite permanent wetlands, but they weren't really, um, you know, they weren't totally temporary, and they weren't full on ponds or marshes, but but they were watery areas that lingered in the spring and fall and uh, and left uh, and often uh, attracted birds. But often the consequence of unwanted or they're often the consequence of incidental, um, you know, other uses of the land like farming. And um, and so uh, floodles does seem to still be like a Midwest specific term, but um, but maybe through this film, it'll get a few more people utilizing uh, the word and thinking about these very um, these these very vulnerable uh, watery areas on the landscape. Um, so uh, this uh, film is uh, my interpretation of wetlands and floodles. I'm sure somebody else could have could come at it another way. Um, so you, the result is a film that's pretty heavy on the number of birds. Uh, that you see and the species throughout. And, um, you know, so, some of the audiences I've shown this to that are more of the uh, the, the the Ducks Unlimited crowd are, are kind of like, wow, I didn't even know there were that many other bird species uh, using these lands, but and including some of the people who were interviewed for the film. So, um, so I hope you enjoy it. It's about 30 minutes in length. And note that this was a slightly edited version. I went back, had some time this summer, 
there are a few sneak preview screenings that we did, a few downstate, and um, I kind of took some feedback and was thinking about what would resonate with audiences, and I made some adjustments to kind of um, um, just uh, make the pace a little bit uh, a little bit more quick and to fit it under 30 minutes in case we could ever get this uh, on a television program. So uh, I'm going to share my screen, and uh, we'll be back uh, later. So. All right. Virtual round of applause for Fluddles. I'll do an actual applause. Thank you. So virtual thank round of applause, everybody. Thank you so thank much, you much for sharing this <laughs> film. Um, <clears throat> so with that said, do you folks have any questions? Feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat there. But I think I'll go ahead and at least get the conversation started here. Um, a lot of organizations and individuals that were featured in this film that are all kind of doing their part uh, to realize this vision of the reason return of these wetlands, you know, and I, I can't help but notice that, you know, for a lot of us, especially here in Chicago, many of us being based here in Chicago, maybe we haven't heard the work of these individuals, maybe like you were saying at the beginning, haven't even heard the term floodles. What was it like kind of trying to track these folks down and get them to participate in the film? Were they familiar with each other? Was it kind of just sort of disparate work that you had to, to track down? Or yeah, what was that like trying to get all these folks together? Yes, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so uh, it really started with, uh, it was relationship driven and almost like networking. So um, our associate producer, or he became our associate producer, Bill Davison, who's based in Bloomington Normal, uh, had um, told me about a an initiative to map floodles in McLean County. So they have a map, like a Google map, um, probably more advanced than that. They probably used GIS or something like that. And they have little dots on like a map, 800 of them mapping where the floodles or potential floodles uh, were located and meeting him really kind of kicked things off. He introduced me to Jason Bly, um, who's featured throughout the film. And Jason works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And he invited me to an expo or a showcase that is in the film that took place. He was really insistent on inviting me to that event, by the way. I was a little hesitant to go to it because I wasn't sure if the film this was going to become a film or not. And, but I went there and at that event was also the wetlands initiative, Ducks Unlimited, um, Illinois Department of Natural Resources seemed like a, a lot of the player players in the project. And so um, it was a lot of just being introduced to people um, and asking them if they would mind being on camera and um, and so uh, the Nature Conservancy kind of came in later um, through Pete Fenner, who's a, a great guy and a great birder out of the Peoria area. And so it was just kind of making connections and and then asking people if they were open to talking. And um, it ended up going in certain directions I wouldn't have expected. So I didn't really even know that there was this much active work on because it's fairly new work all of the wetland construction and i didn't even know that that was happening when it started um that the floodles could be sort of man-made as well as um as well as just being there by chance so um and it seemed like you know i think it's always good when you can show regular people taking steps to do uh, do things that are really important for uh, for birds and the environment. So that's kind of how some of that came together. But there were, there were probably a lot of, yeah, there were a lot of visits down uh, toward central Illinois, but really the sort of the hub of the wheel was Livingston County, which is where Pontiac is. And it, at least in multiple properties there were that are in the film are in uh, Livingston County, including the one where that expo or showcase took place where they were uh, had all those big, vehicles moving around, pushing dirt around to show people how these things could be constructed. 
Excellent, thank you. Um, so I have a question here from Diana in the chat, um, indicating she's really kind of her early introduction to these ephemeral wetlands. She's asking, is floodal meaning the same thing essentially as a vernal pool? Are they the same thing? Is uh, there a distinction at all? Um, I would say floodals are sort of are more based usually in agricultural areas, um, you know, or maybe bigger parks or forest preserves out in the fields. It's more I associate them more with fields, whereas I would say vernal pools, which are also fascinating and uh, and hot spots of biodiversity and so important. I associate them more with uh, with forests and and woodlands. Um, but there's a lot that one could say the two would have in common and also probably both very vulnerable uh, habitat types and important for, you know, a, a huge range of species from, you know, microscopic species to, to plants to animals. Um, so, um, yeah, a little bit of a distinction, but some of the same premise in that it's usually due to snowmelt or runoff uh, from the previous winter. Uh, or just, you know, rainy, uh, a rainy spring. I have a question here from Noah asking if there are any organizations in place that help farmers do the work of building stable floodles uh, and reduce the labor, the costs, uh, yeah. the incentives, et cetera. So what I, um, what is mostly depicted in the film is, uh, is a program through the USDA that uh, encourages farmers and landowners to put uh, water or keep water on the land or put water on the land. And as part of that, their costs are reimbursed for the construction. Uh, you know, so basically, if you look at your as as uh, Jim Keatsman says uh, in the film, if you look at your bottom line and think about whether you're putting a lot of uh, seed cost and fertilizer cost, into an area that's always flooded uh, and not getting anything out of it, and you're just losing money, at least if you install a wetland uh, in that area instead, you reduce your losses and you're paid for it. <laughs> uh, the, your, your costs are covered. Um, plus you get the benefits of enjoying the you know recreational habitat and, and the beauty. So um, so there, these bills are, are these uh, programs are through the farm bill that I'm referring to. There are probably other ones, um, state-based ones, um, or you can maybe contact an organization like the Wetlands Initiative and they 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 maybe could work directly. Um, so so yeah, that I think that mostly answers your question. And I see there's a follow-up. <laughs> yeah, well, we got a couple questions about the biodiversity in particular. Okay, here. go ahead. Kaylin and Noah both kind of touch on it, but we have a question from Kaylin asking to what extent are fuddles contaminated with pesticides and herbicides if they're a lot of, you know, primarily runoff from farmland and is there any harm to wildlife by utilizing them? Yeah, actually, it, that's a question I've encountered multiple times. I know we make the point that there is the uh, sort of dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And so my, I, this is my inference is that when all those chemicals are washing down into the Gulf of Mexico at a super high volume and scale, they it, it mu they must interact in a way that creates those huge dead zones. They must be more soluble and less detrimental to birds. I'm probably giving them too much credit <laughs> uh, upstream when they're in the floodles because I, the birds are utilizing those habitats and don't appear to like you know be suffering. I don't I imagine. I guess they. There would be an interesting study to know whether their lifespans are shortened or something because of their proximity. Um, so, um, but anyway, yeah, it's, um, I don't know that those chemicals are immediately detrimental to uh, to species. And in fact, uh, the point was made that you know the water, the wetlands are used to filter out the stuff and actually, um, you know uptake the nitri nitrates and things like that and reduce the amount of that stuff in the in the water. So um, so it, it may be that they're not too bad. This is just me, though. I'm certainly not a biologist or a scientist. 
Um, yeah, maybe I'll also answer some of the questions in this next one, just about uh, if you're familiar with any any work around kind of the microbiota and other aquatic creatures that use those wetlands that obviously also birds are using and potentially eating. Yeah, I do, I, yeah, that's a great follow-up question. I, I don't know, um, but, you know, there it seems like the worms and other things like that, the the, the larva, et cetera, that they seem to be fairly plentiful because you're seeing just constantly in the uh in the film, the birds just, you know, poking constantly at that at that ground, um, or at the, you know, that watery ground. Um, so I think um I don't know of any any specific research, but that would be super interesting. Um, because there certainly must be a lot in there as well as, you know, amphibian species um too so um and and then you're having nesting birds and, and i imagine uh you know dragonflies emerging going through their life cycle i mean there's probably a whole lot that could be looked at i have a question here from maureen um asking is it possible for these farmers to essentially remove some of their drain tiles and some of those uh kind of flood mitigation measures measures or is it an all or nothing proposition <laughs> Uh, no, it does seem like it could it's it uh it it could be gradual or partial. So um yeah, it it definitely seems that way. And it's uh, what I heard was you know some people had the drain the drain tile still, so, you know, some people were still uh dealing with like cracked old ceramic pipes that have been there for like a hundred years and and it was causing causing problems and then you know then you see these black plastic pipes going in and it it but it's you know yeah that there probably could have been a whole film just on drain tile because it kept being discussed and um and yeah but it, i mean short answer i think yes you can you can kind of do what you want if you want to remove some of it uh keep some of it you could do that you can put in these water control structures, which is really what the constructed wetland has, where they can they put in this. It, it looks like a metal box that basically they can lift um, these sort of slats out of, and and it can can flood flood the ground. Um, so you can do things to make the water controllable. And then the other interesting thing is I heard from Wes Lehman, who's in the film uh, from Feather Prairie Farm, is that as he went through the project and improved his uh, water systems uh, while keeping floodles on the land and wetlands on the land, the upstream farmer who didn't have anything to do with the project benefited because all like he hooked up his pipe to that guy's pipe and all his water started to flow down to Wes's land. And um, this guy upstream had nothing to do with it. Was like, oh, now I'm high and dry. <laughs> so, um, so there's just some interesting, um, you know, outcomes that are that that seem very positive, especially when you take someone like Wes, who's really committed to having a very robust wetland uh, for his his farm, which is really largely used. He's a he's an avid waterfowl hunter, as he mentioned. But he also has a, his wife uh, has a business of training. Uh, dogs and they go in the the waters that he's kind of created so they can um, practice like retrieving what I imagine is like retrieving waterfowl for the hunters out there. That's a fascinating symbiosis of business models there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you and, and, I, yeah, you do hear, and I think I can't recall if John Dasso mentioned it in the film, but like you do hear often that people have multiple jobs who are into farming. And that certainly was the case um, with almost everybody I talked to. You've got to vote, by the way, for a movie about drain tiles. So just- Yeah, um, I, I would love to do a movie. <laughs> I also have here, uh, see here, uh, Diane, just really appreciative post. Thank you a lot for what you've you know displayed here and what's possible. And I think actually a good question emerges from it, even though it wasn't a question. So thank you, Diane, for the inspiration for the question. But, you know, so you you listed a lot of organizations here and individuals that are working on these things. You know, how do people basically learn more? Where do they go to potentially say, hey, you know, friend who's a farmer or somebody down the street, or maybe I'm a farmer. How do they start going down this road? Yeah, I, I, it does seem like right now it's just a lot of, it is a lot of word of mouth um, and hand-to-hand -hand outreach. So like what, Jason Bly does uh, is 
you know, convenings with farmers and landowners and and networking and making connections. They do some mailings and things like that, like where they look at, um, you know, top topographic maps and look at places where there might be good potential for wetlands. Um, but I think if you're just an average person out there, you know, it's being exposed to these concepts, being open to them. I don't, I don't, you know, because certainly you still see people putting the drain tile in and just doing like their best to continue to try to drain stuff, um, which is like an age old, uh, you know, practice that, that it takes a long time to break or, or to, you know, transition away from. So I think it seems like people are getting connected through the programs on a kind of one-to-one -one basis, but, um, you know, I think there probably is a way to market these even more broadly and, um, you know, they continue to just be putting more and more of these wetlands in. So it seems like it's working. I mean, the other thing is the cost of corn and soybeans um, is, I think, maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, it was relatively low, which was further encouraging people to put in wetlands, put their ground into wetlands. And there are just some basic market forces probably at play too. So, um, but... I think, you know, I'm I'm a marketer and communicator by trade. So I'm uh, <laughs> I always I like a good marketing campaign. So you I got a lot of thoughts. <laughs> yeah. So I do it's it's sort of like, you know what, it'd be really great if there was just a marketing campaign that uh that went out and and just, you know, said everybody needs to get a wetland on their farm. You know, every single farm should have one. So a reminder, folks, if you've got a question, go ahead and put them in the chat there. We'll make sure we get them in front of Bob. I have a birding question. Just go to all sure. getting back to basics here. How does one bird fluddles? I know you put a lot of miles out, out in these agricultural areas. <laughs> yeah. You know, again, to somebody who doesn't know or yes. familiar, I mean, where yeah. the heck are birds? How, where do you start? How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, this is not, yeah, gimme by any means. And I consider you someone who's pretty into birding <laughs> to ask that question. Um, uh, in fact, one of the people who helped with the project, Steve Huggins, who I'm sure Edward would know, um, I happen to be birding out in some of these areas, gotten some tips from people like Bill Davison, who was helping out with the film as to where to go. I was with Jason Bly, who was taking me to these places, and I was like, oh, these would be great birding areas, but nobody knows about them. Uh, in fact, Steve Huggins knew about a couple of the places, incidentally, and I was like, oh, yeah, I was at the same spot, like, you know, very recently. So some people do know about them, but we came up across certain areas where I would say they had never been formally birded before, um, which I thought was pretty awesome. And uh, we took a two Fluddles field trips, one of which is featured uh, prominently in the film, where we just brought people out to these locales that very few birders had ever visited. Um, a lot of it would just be like driving around to see what you can see or look at a map and take a guess where there might be some water. Um, they're not hot spots on eBird generally. I would almost discourage making them that because you wouldn't want too many people going. And and then you have um, a couple of counties like McLean County has taken it upon itself to have this Fluddles map. McHenry County has a Fluddles map that I I used a lot. So filmed a few things there that ended up in the film. But you just had, there were just these amazing experiences where I would just sit by the Fluddle uh, and wait. And there might not be any birds when I arrived, but, you know, soon enough, something would just show up like Dunlin or, or Dowichers. And um, the, it was, there was a very cool, like, outdoors, natural nature experience. Um a lot of chorus frogs uh, singing constantly in the spring. And, um, you know, so it, it yeah, th this is a, you know, it's a lot of driving um, and, um, and just keeping your eyes out and maybe talking to other people who know the area fairly well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not real easy. These aren't always easy places to find, but it's also what kind of made it a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, thanks for that question. Any other questions? Oh, there we go. We got one.
So Diane's asking, um, what about um, contributing to more free showings for floodles, especially in venues where farmers are likely to see it? Fairs, agricultural gatherings, et cetera. Um, basically, it sounds like Diane is volunteering to help <laughs> make those connections. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is possible to show it. Uh, it's it's. I have a, a little bit harder time making it to everywhere these days, but I definitely, I mean, Farm Bureau would be great. Um, I would also say my the people who helped make the film and some of the people who appeared in the film may be willing to, uh, you know, team up on a showing. So, uh, Diane, if you wanted to reach out, I'd be glad to have that conversation. Um, so I think, yeah, there could be people who could um, help out with showing and um, and yeah, help to share that story as, as a tool to further engage people. Um, you know, yeah, I'm still, I'm working to get it onto uh, public television uh, downstate and, um, you know, uh, the, the, there is a video link available. Um, I could, I could maybe drop it in the chat um if anybody wants to check it out uh it's it's still a rental or a purchase um but at the same time if you, if you wanted to uh access it and show it to someone I'm, i would not complain or I, I might be able to help out with that in some way um <laughs> thank you yeah i i i, I hope so i mean it I think a lot of it uh, is just talking to people. What my what I gathered was talking to people on their terms and talking about the benefits, and you know realizing that most people want to have clean water. Most people enjoy seeing wildlife at some level. So I think you know being able to to convey that, and then it's just a common sense you know decision from people. You get that perspective from a few of the people in the film. Um, yeah, so the, the yeah, question here from right Diana answer. asking, yeah. how long does it take for these floodles to basically develop and then the life to return to them, like the invertebrates and the nematodes? Yeah, um, I mean, as far as the, uh, you know, once there's water there, the, there's, uh, the birds are there and the, the prey items are there. I mean, it, it that's seemingly immediate. I mean, I, I see the you know, solitary sandpipers in my nearest forest preserve, uh, you know, you get one heavy spring rain and there they are. Um, I, th I think for the more, you know, the, the floodles that have a little more to them that aren't just the basics, like you saw a few in the film that are pretty small and um, don't have a lot of vegetation grown up yet. Um, you know, the, that, I don't know how much uh, biodiversity is in that in those but that, then i saw others with you know much more established where you just had uh you know sora rails and virginia you know virginia rails and things like that and you know uh, all sorts of frog species and i i don't know enough uh to answer that question about like nematodes but um but i think the it seems like these critters sort of find these places and and even in the most unlikely locales um you know, you could be way out in the middle of dry land and have, have you know, aquatic species. I will throw out there that it's my understanding, and I assume is applicable to this situation as well, but, you know, oftentimes when it comes to colonizing new waterways, birds themselves are responsible yeah. for a lot of movement, yeah. you know, by taking animals along that hitchhike on them, whether exactly. they fish eggs or small invertebrates or microorganisms. So I would not be shocked if, you know, the, the same sort of rules that apply to like small ponds and lakes also apply to floodles where maybe these shorebirds moving from floodle to floodle are bringing some of that with them and helping that colonization process. Yep. That's a great point. Yeah, I, I totally agree. All right, don't see any other questions. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. But once again, thank you all so much for joining us here. Big round of applause for Bob and his film Floodles. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us here uh, and showing your work to us and inspiring uh, folks here tonight with your work. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, 
we will follow up with, a, with an email to everybody with some links, uh, including that link to that to the, to the film itself. So if you want to rent it, watch it again, share it with your friends, you're welcome to. Um, Flittles also has a landing page on uh, Bob's website, so you can learn more about that project and work and future screenings as they get scheduled and things like that. Uh, but once again, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, be on the lookout for future Birds and Bites events as well uh, and other just programs in general on these different topics at the Chicago Birder website. With that said, have a great evening. Uh, enjoy this beautiful summer weather, and we'll see you guys on the next program. Take care. Thanks, Edward.